Section 4. Critique of Penhoff. David Rhodes finds some obvious caveats with the Penhoff theory. He worries about the validity of making such a big leap between a very low level of description and a very high level of description, such as consciousness. If nature does, in fact, make such a big leap, then what are all the intermediate levels for? For example, why do you need nerves, nerve cells and neural networks? Why are nerve cells shaped the way they are? Why is the cortex anatomically different from the basal ganglia, and so on? Rose says, The process of cause and effect seems to leap over these intermediate levels. He also asks why interfering with these intermediate levels should affect consciousness. Why does losing blood supply to the brain or giving someone a hallucinogenic drug affect their consciousness? There must be some relevant processes at the intermediate levels of synaptic neurotransmitters and anatomical structure. But as Penrose points out, uh, but as Rose points out, Penhoff does not s- specify what these processes are. Wolf and Hammerhoff, 2001, have, however, attempted to answer such questions. They suggest that neurophysiological processes, as revealed by conventional research, are all pre-conscious. These processes are what Rose above called intermediate levels. And according to Wolf and Hammerhoff, they affect which neurons are involved in creating any given quantum wave function. The proposal as to how this works is as follows. During the activation of a synapse, a chemical cascade is initiated within the dendrite. This turns on or off the ability of the microtubules to host quantum states and thus determines whether or not that particular cell will generate consciousness. Wolf and Hammerhoff further posit that the quantum wave function relevant to consciousness is not usually restricted to the microtubules within a single neuron, but is normally spread throughout the brain, or at least a region of the brain. By opening and closing gap junctions between dendrites, Wolf and Hammerhoff speculate the spread of quantum waves between neurons is initiated and controlled. Once created, it is the collapse of a wave function that constitutes a conscious experience or a conscious decision. Thus, to explain consciousness fully, we still need to know about all the neuroanatomy, physiology and pharmacology. Yet the hard question remains unanswered. How is it that collapsing a wave function leads to phenomenal experience, i.e. qualia? Rose also criticises the specificity of the Penhoff theory in selecting microtubules as the location for the generation of consciousness. Rose says, microtubules are in fact a component of all cells, from amoeba upwards. Certainly, small single-celled organisms have microtubules in them. So, does this mean that every organism that contains microtubules is conscious? Or is there something special about the microtubules in nerve cells? And if so, only in human brains 
or in animal brains as well. The theory comes close to panpsychism. It seems too broad. Dennett also expresses a very similar criticism. Having mentioned Penhoff's speculation about possible quantum effects occurring in the microtubules of the cytoskeleton of neurons, he casually dismisses it as a non-starter, but adds that he can't resist raising one question for Penrose to ponder. If the magnificent quantum property lurks in the microtubules, does that mean that cockroaches have non-computable minds too? They have the same kind of microtubules we have. Penrose and Hammerhoff attempt to rebuff this sort of criticism as follows. Microtubules in neurons are quite distinct from those in other cells. Firstly, they are arrayed in parallel rather than radially, because unlike other cells, neurons lack centrioles. Secondly, they are quite stable. Thirdly, they are far more abundant in neurons than other cells, form larger and more complex networks, and have a greater genetic variability than other tissues. Raymond Tallis also comments critically on the Penhoff claim that the unity of consciousness may be underpinned by quantum coherence generated within microtubules in the brain. Tallis says that this doesn't persuade him for many reasons. The most obvious objection is this. The kind of structures that are supposed to house quantum coherence are widely distributed throughout the nervous system and are not confined to those areas that are associated with consciousness. It might be argued somewhat tendentiously that quantum coherence does not make you conscious but unifies your consciousness if you have it already. We should, however, be suspicious of thinking of consciousness as a kind of stuff that is potentially dissipated but can be called to order by what, after all, are microscopic physical forces. Besides, there is no reason why the unification that quantum coherence supposedly imposes should translate into subjective or experienced unity, even less into a unity in which multiplicity is retained. The brain itself, after all, is at one level a single unified material item, and so should provide all the coherence that is needed, if the physics of the system were going to provide it. And what is more, has the added advantage of being the right kind of size. Talis also criticises the whole idea that appealing to the strange properties of matter, as observed by quantum physicists, can make it seem more likely to accommodate mind. His major point is that the bizarre qualities of quantum mechanics are present in all things, both conscious and not. Talis further criticises Penhoff's suggestion that the unity of consciousness can be explained by quantum coherence that would bind together activity across different parts of the brain. He says, according to them, quantum coherence is due to a particular structure in the neurons, namely a folded membrane called the endoplasmic reticulum. Unfortunately, this membrane is seen in all neurons, including the vast majority of them that no one would accuse of being conscious. 
and in many tissues outside the nervous system, and in the cells of organisms that are not conscious. There is also the little problem that macroscopic coherence in a warm, wet brain is somewhat short-lived, approximately uh, 10 to the power of 13 seconds, a rather thin sliver of time. This is not the kind of interval out of which you could get much sense of unity or indeed coherence, never mind a biography. David Rose also picks up on the temperature problem for a quantum theory of consciousness. He says there are important doubts about whether the relevant quantum states can be created at normal body temperatures. Such states normally require very low temperature conditions and isolation from other systems. In response, the Penhoff partners quote the work of Freulich, 1968, 70 and 75, who found that in dipolar, in dipole biomolecules structurally confined in membranes, MTs and ordered water on their surfaces become excited coherently by biochemical and thermal energy. The excitations reduce to a common frequency mode, somewhat like the quantum phenomenon of a Bose-Einstein condensate. In Bose-Einstein condensates, like superconductors, coherence is attained by extreme cooling to remove thermal vibrations. In lasers and in the Freulich model, the coherence derives from energy pumping. At face value, this seems to contradict the objections about temperature and isolation. They also specifically link bioquantum processes to information processing. Froelich coherence among the hydrophobic pockets within MT subunits has been proposed as a basis for information processing via neighbor tubulin dipole interactions, e.g. as in a cellular automation. The coherent, the coherent dynamics are viewed also to order water at empty outer and inner surfaces. The cytoplasm can transiently assume a quantum coherent state.